Take it away, Barbara. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me today to introduce Dr. Gildi Jackson um, as our colloquium speaker. Um, Gildi got his PhD in 2018 from the University of Adelaide in Australia. I was fortunate to meet him in 2019 at a chronology meeting uh, in Germany where I was able to recruit him and he has been with us um, since 2019. Gildi works on a variety of problems. He is an expert in thermochronology and petrochronology of appetites and other accessory minerals. He has pushed forward uh, a lot of te technique development and has also applied uh, thermochronology to a variety of interesting tectonic problems. So it's, it's, I would say I would consider him as a modern uh, tectonicist thermochronologist. Um, is not only doing a lot of interesting research from the tectonic relationships between the Pamir and the Tian Shan uh, to applications of thermochronology to the Laramide, uh, Central Asia, more recently Argentina, to new technique, technique development like um, applications of fission track to Manazite as a, potentially, a, a potential thermochronometer and paleo thermometer. Uh, so is is also has been instrumental in um, managing the fish and track lab and and really helping me with my group over the last few years as I was uh, am still department head and I don't know where I will do without actually having you in the lab. Um, he has a uh, about twenty published papers so far with four in review and seven as first author and so it's pretty impressive and I have the feeling that is going to leave us pretty soon because it's getting hard. So. With that, uh, I'm excited to see what he has to tell us about the relationships between climate, uh, tectonics, and energy. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's to be praised by someone who is praiseworthy. Um, hi, everyone. As introduced, I'm, I'm Gilly. I, I know most of you, and I am really excited to uh, to talk to you all today about something that I think is is really interesting, and I. I'm sort of really excited to talk to uh, the University of Arizona about this and, and really nervous to talk to the University of Arizona about this because I see this as like a uniquely Arizona problem. It, it, it sort of really tries to pull in those strengths of Arizona, which is this, this really zoomed out, broad scale uh, perspective on tectonics, but then tries to always integrate that into, you know, how we view, how do we view paleoclimate and our isotope, our environmental isotope record. And so um, just to start with, I, I, I'd just like to show, um, I, I just quite like this image. Um, so it's, a, it's sort of like a, a mountainous landscape. It is, it is the modern topography and, and in it, we see the, the processes that I will be talking about today. Uh, the clouds sort of signifying the precipitation, the atmospheric processes that act on, on the topography. And, and in, the, in the sort of foreground covered by the low hills, there's a, there's a, there's a thrust fault. And so it's how these two interact to, uh, to manifest the, the modern topography that I'll, I'll be discussing today. So this is, uh, this is not a new problem. In, in, in fact, it's a, it's a really old one and put, uh, put very nicely about 30 years ago in this uh, really interesting paper by England and uh, Molnar in England. And really, if you, if you sort of synthesized it down, they sort of were like, okay, so the distribution of modern topography it is, it is a function of either rock uplift or tectonics and, and sort of global climate change and how that interacts with, with the rock uplift. And their ultimate synthesis was like, well, these two, these two uh, processes act hand in hand to generate the modern topography. And there is, there's really no way to pull it apart. And I, I actually kind of find this, uh, this kind of paper almost like a tad frustrating because it really shuts down our um, discussion of it. I think that in the last 30 years, there's potential, some, a lot of potential for us to go from a qualitative observation on this to a quantitative one. And I'm hoping to make some steps in that direction. And so to sort of like signify our two sides, I've got some nice uh, visualizations of that. Uh, so on one side, the, the sort of climate aspect of things. So this is a, a GIF from Mount Bashkara in, in Georgia and, and, and Russia. And it's, a, it's just a GIF of a, a four year time lapse from uh, 2017 to 2020, and it, you just you just see the rock face just melt away, 
And that's without any seismic activity. That's just from the freezing and the thawing of the ice. So that would signify the climate and how that would then impact, impact the topography. On the other hand, this lovely image from, uh, from George Davis uh, of, a, of a monocline in Arizona. And I'd, I'd not come out come across monoclines until I'd moved out to the US. And uh, they're really quite striking. I mean, how could you argue that, that, uh, that tectonics isn't the major role on the modern topography when you can just see a, a basically a piston or a gear rising up out of, the, out of the crust? And so people who work on this and think about this broadly like favor one or the one or the one or the other camp. And so there are those that go, okay, all of the topography, most of the topography that we observe is a function of tectonics. So here's a, a really nice schematic diagram from uh, Shilgan and others in 2018. Mm -hmm. And really what it just shows is here are these major structures. And what we've got is the, the warmer colors here illustrating the topography being uh, young and, and sort of active. And then as we move away from these structures, it gets progressively uh, older and less active. And so this would be the, the sort of people who are favoring tectonics as a control on the modern topography. Now, on the other hand, there are those that are like, well, actually there's not a, not a lot goes on without the climate coupling with that, without these surface processes. And a really good example of that is some some interesting, some really seminal work by uh, Whipple in 2009, but more recently by Carl Lang in, in 2020, looking at the, uh, the Southern Alps in New Zealand. And these workers find that the, the orography, the topography of the Southern Alps in New Zealand is really influenced by the, uh, the coupling of the westerlies onto the Western side of, of the Alps. And that really changes the morphology. And so, these would be the, the sort of side of the argument that say, well, the whole thing is, is sort of is modulated and regulated by, by climate. Now, the reason that we end up at this point and the reason that people end up with these very extreme mindsets is because these two systems are inexorably linked. They are, they are quite coupled. And it, it sort of is summed up really nicely by another England and Molnar paper about surface uplift. So the topography we observe is surface uplift. So it's illustrated by this GIF here. And that is simply a function of uh, rock uplift minus exhumation, so erosion. And so those who would uh, those who promote tectonics being the major control would say, well, look, you know, you need uh, a lot of structure going. You need these big structures feeding slip and generating the modern topography. And and those and those sort of favoring a, a, a more climate approach would say, well, you're not gonna you're not gonna move much rock if if you don't take stuff off the top. You're not gonna move a fault if you're not sort of constantly eroding things away. And, and in fact, if you don't have any erosion, that fault would become uh, inactive because of the overburden, and the new fault would have to propagate out. So you wouldn't actually get that much uh, topography as, as a result. And here is, here is where I think we can kind of start to pick away at the problem. And, and we have a really nice tool that helps us start to look at precisely exhumation. And maybe we can start to impact, we can look at how, uh, we can start to unpick uh, what's influencing exhumation. And the tool of course is low temperature thermochronology, certainly a, a favorite of mine. So Low temperature thermochronology is a member of radiogenic dating. I'm sure uh, most people in this room are extremely familiar with it, but for the uninitiated um, who would probably be more, uh, more familiar with maybe a uranium lead system, uh, low temperature thermochronology works by essentially recording the time at which a rock or a mineral phase cools through a certain temperature window. So, um, Unlike, uh, so when you, um, uh, so, uh, so uh, for example, um, for, and for example, the one that I would like to use is, um, is fission track. And so uh, the way to consider it is that um, fission track uses uh, the, uranium, the, the spontaneous decay of uranium-238. And so uranium-238 undergoes two decay schemes. There's sort of the uranium lead decay scheme that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, where uh, uranium undergoes alpha decay into lead-206. 
However, a very small subset of uranium particles undergo spontaneous fission, which is an extremely aggressive uh, decay style where uh, a uranium, an atom of uranium-238 breaks up into, uh, into two equivalently sized particles and generate lattice damage. And they're denoted by these fission tracks. So above a certain temperature, these fission tracks are, are this, this sort of damage is able to be healed by the mineral lattice. The mineral lattice is, is energetic enough to heal that damage. However, below a certain temperature range, uh, those, fission, uh, those uh, fission products get uh, locked in. And that temperature range is, is really interesting. It's, it's, quite, it's quite cool. It's a, about as cool as a, a cup of tea, um, about 110 degrees to about 60 degrees. Now, uh, the way to consider this and the way that I would like us to be considering this is that, well, the, the, how you get a rock to that, how you get the rock to that temperature, if you, the rock starts at the deep in the crust quite hot, uh, is you basically bring it closer to the surface. And so people actually uh, make people, what people do with low temperature thermochronology is they relate it to uh, a depth, a, a time of which the rock cools to a certain depth. And so now, given a, a sort of normal geothermal gradient of, of maybe 25 degrees per, uh, Celsius per kilometer, what we're looking at is uh, a timing of uh, a fission track age relates to when the rock cools to the upper five to three kilometers of the crust. So really the, the upper little bit, it's, it's kind of hard to get uh, any cooler than these, these sort of temperatures, despite the fact we're, we're really trying to. So this is interesting when it comes to thinking about contractional origin. So when we're thinking about uh, shortening dominated orogenic systems, so the main way to cool a rock in a contractional origin is there are, there are sort of two ways to do it. So one way you could uh, bring that rock closer to the surface is you know, here we have a thrust fault. So we could keep propagating slip along that thrust. We could keep building up this angle until that slope becomes too great. It fails and that would expose a uh, rock that had been at deeper levels. And that if you kept sort of going along on that method, you could potentially exhume rock and, and cool them to the surface. Now, the other way to do it is through uh, surface processes such as precipitation or river incision. That would basically cut through the rock, eroding away material and exhuming deeper rocks, cooling them to the surface. And so this is really useful. Uh, so in a, in a contractional origin, it's because it's useful for us to start looking at exhumation as a, as a proxy for erosion. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about thermochron ages. I'm gonna be talking a lot about cooling ages, exhumation ages, and I'm gonna jump around interchangeably between them because I've got into really bad habits. But what I want you to know is that if we keep all things equal in a contractional origin, an older thermochron age would mean uh, less erosion, observing it from the present day, and a younger thermochron age would be, there's been more erosion. And when I say a thermochron age, I'm really just saying, the time at which that rock gets to the, uh, to the upper crust. So we have our tool, and now I think we need our study area. And what better study area than, uh, than Central Asia? Um, so this is, uh, this is an excellent study region for, for several reasons. And I, and I think that the first one is that when people look at the climate tectonics discussion and how they interface, they typically focus on, on sort of specific structures or uh, sort of uh, one system, one origin. And, and I think that's, that's sort of very powerful, but you know, erosion and climate and tectonics and, and, and erosion are, are sort of continental to global scale systems. And so where Eurasia is, uh, Central Asia is really powerful is because, okay, one, it's, it's a really large area. Uh, it's really large and there's been a lot of data collected there. So this is, a, this is a place that is tectonically extremely diverse. There is a number of different origin systems within this, uh, in this area. And as a result, plenty of boots have been on the ground and collected plenty of data. The other reason that we, I've chosen Fission Track as my tool, not just because I love it, is because it's been around for about 60 years and the dates still hold up. So you, know, you can trust that, that even the old data is still relevant today. 
The other thing about Central Asia is it's got a very diverse range of orogenic systems. Of course, it has a very diverse range of climate processes that couple with it. And so as a result, the, and these, these sort of orogenic and climate processes have been coupling and interacting over a really prolonged period of time. Um, and, and in fact, in fact we, could, we could pull it all the way back to the Proterozoic, but we've, we've got to sort of start and finish somewhere. So um, just keep an eye on, on Tarim. We're going to just start in the Permo-Triassic. So um, in the Permo-Triassic, I'm going to start our discussion because that's basically when Tarim accretes to Eurasia. And that is when I would, I think the, uh, the sort of main uh, Eurasia as we think about it today starts accreting. Uh, once, this, uh, once the sort of closure of this ocean and the accretion of Tarim has occurred, we enter a, a sort of period of time known as the Cimmerian orogeny. And so the Cimmerian orogeny spanned from the Triassic. And basically what it was, was a series of uh, peri-Gondwanan terrains that, that rifted off Gondwana in the south and then accreted to Eurasia in the north. And this went on throughout, through the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. And so it really built up the Eurasian landmass, but, but things, things in Eurasia uh, really kick off in, in the late, uh, sorry, in the early Cenozoic with the, with the collision of, of India with Asia. So this, I think, uh, I think would be reasonable to say is probably one of the largest collisions that, that we sort of are aware of. And, and the India-Asia collision had a, had a really profound impact on on Central Asia. It not only did it uh, generate the largest sedimentary efflux out from, um, out from the Himalaya and Tibet into the Bay of Bengal, it generates some of the highest uh, relief we've got, Mount Everest and Nepal. It significantly contributes to the building of the world's largest orogenic plateau in Tibet. And it, it completely reactivated the Eurasian interior, putting high relief in, uh, into the far, into far into the far reaches of Central Asia, like uh, in the Altai and Xinjiang. And so I think here we have a, a really uh, interesting case study, a really interesting uh, system to start looking at how these processes couple through time. And so what we can do is we could possibly, what well, basically what we should expect is that all of our, um, we should expect that all of our, uh, our so we understand that a lot of the topography of Central Asia is controlled largely by this India-Asia collision. And so we, to sort of look at this and to test the erosion response of that collision, um, I went and compiled a, a bunch of thermochron data. And we actually compiled about 2,500 points. And so I'm going to sort of step through that. But first, I'd like to just sort of uh, get people oriented. So the first thing is, is I've sort of, I'm going to subdivide this into to three regions. Uh, the first being the Tian Shan Al Patsayan up here. Then I've subdivided into the Pamir Tibet and the Chilean Shan. And then finally the Himalaya. Uh, the other thing to recognize is, is sort of the, the, the uh, sorry, the color scheme that's going to start coming up. Uh, so cooler colors are going to be sort of dry, uh, Triassic, Jurassic ages where warmer colors are sort of Miocene and Eocene ages, with the sort of cyans and greens being sort of late Cretaceous, early Cenozoic. So just starting in the Tian Shan and the Altai Saiyan, uh, the Altai Saiyan, uh, surprisingly consistent, all of the erosional ages are, are coming back at about, about mid, mid to late Cretaceous. But then once we start looking in the, in the Tian Shan Altai Saiyan, the, the large majority, sorry, the Tian Shan, the large majority of those uh, ages that we get out of there are coming back quite old relative to what, um, quite relatively old. So sort of Triassic and Jurassic ages, except on these, on these Southern margins and along these major structures like the uh, Talus Fagana Fault. Stepping into the Pamir Tibet, um, on the margins of, of sort of Tibet, so around in the Pamir and the, and the Long Menshan and, and Southern Tibet, we've got, uh, we start, we get quite young cooling ages. So um, quite young cooling ages, sort of uh, Paleogene and, and sort of um, Eocene ages. 
But then in, uh, in the interior, we're sort of starting to get the preservation of a, a few late Cretaceous, early Cenozoic ages. And then in the Chilean Shan, it's, it's, all, it's all pretty pretty old. And then finally, in the Himalaya, as, as we would sort of expect, it's all going to be very young, sort of ages of about from one to about 20 million years. And so with this data set, we can start, uh, we can sort of ask a really, really interesting question. And, and it's kind of deceptively simple, which is, is, is exhumation or, or sort of our proxy for erosion, is it, is it controlled by the India-Asia collision? Or is it controlled by, uh, or is it controlled by another process, perhaps climate? And this is, uh, this is um, something we can explore because it gives us very testable hypotheses. If we, if it's the India-Asia collision, we should see uh, a load of ages coming back at about the timing of India-Asia collision, about 60 to 45 MA. Um, there should be a, a really nice correlation between the thermochron ages and the structures. And there should be a relationship between these thermochron ages and rock uplift. Now, if it's not, if it's climate, then I guess what we would expect is that there's possibly a, a relationship between thermochron ages and precipitation. There's probably not going to be such a strong relationship between thermochron ages and major structures. And uh, there'll be probably no or, a, or an inverted relationship between um, rock uplift and, and thermochron ages. So I've got to pick some proxies to, to test this data set against. And I'm just going to use, uh, I've got uh, three here. So the first one is, is just a, a nice sort of broad one. Uh, I'm going to use increasing distance from structure. So the idea there being that, uh, that this would be the proxy for, uh, for structural control on the ages. For uh, rock uplift, I'm going to use geodetic strain based on uh, global GPS mo uh, movements. And then for my climate proxy, I'm going to use global annual precipitation. There are a lot of structures in Asia, we've both, so we've got to narrow that down. Um, so the two that I'm going to use for, uh, for the uh, Tian Shan um, Altai Sein, I'm going to use the Tarim Tian Shan boundary. And then for Tibet Pamir and the Himalaya, I'm going to use the boundary between the Himalaya or between India and, and Asia, which is the, the main frontal thrust. Uh, this is how I'm, I'm going to sort of step through the data. Uh, so what I've got up here is, is a little inset map to locate us. And then I'll have the sort of corresponding data uh, down below. And I'll, I'll do this for the, for the, three, uh, the three proxies. So, on the, so this is for the Tian Shan Altai Sein. We've got a thermochronometric age on the y-axis, and we've got distance from the Tian Shan Tarim boundary on the on the uh, sorry on the y-axis, and on distance from the Tian Shan Tarim boundary on the x-axis. And and really, I, I don't I don't really see that distinctive uh, that much of a distinctive trend. I, you know, I, I sort of see that the age is basically generally kind of get older as they get further away from the time tension boundary, but it's, it's, it's pretty scattered. In fact, the only, the only sort of real trend that I would pull out there is I'd say that it's kind of interesting how tightly clustered the, the Altai Saiyan is in the, in the Cretaceous. But where, where the trend really, uh, really takes off is actually in the uh, Pamir Tibet. So here, I, so here we have, what we have here is with increasing distance from the, main frontal thrust, we can see the ages getting older away from, um, away from the Pamir Southern Tibet. And then they kind of get older onto central Tibet. And then as you step off Tibet into the Kunlun, they get younger again before stepping into the Tian Shan where they get older again. And so that's a, that's a really, uh, that's it. that to me seems like a very, um, very striking relationship, really uh, highlighting that as we get further away from the structures, the ages get, get older, so less erosion. And then finally, looking at um, the Himalaya with the distance from the main frontal, front, frontal thrust, you can see a general trend of, of possibly uh, sort of older ages as we get further from the main frontal, fr frontal thrust with perhaps um, a younging in the middle with response to, to high, high glaciation and, and rainfall. So it looks pretty promising that, that that these structures are the major controller on, on these thermochron ages, on, on sort of our exhumation. But hey, we're here, so we may as well look at some paleoclimate, or we may as well look at some climate proxies. 
So for climate proxy, I'm going to use uh, uh, this global compilation by uh, this uh, global synthesis by D and others in 2011, and basically um, uh, high precipitation in, in the darker colors and, and lower precipitation in the lighter colors in millimeters per day. And I, I think here I, I really started to, to be kind of blown away with, with this relationship. So here we are out in, we're going to start again in the, in the Tian Shan um, Altai Saiyan. And okay, so no, no statistically meaningful trend there. I wouldn't want to pull it out. This is precipitation on the Y axis and age on the, on the X axis. And it's an, in a log scale, but so no, no real trend. But, but what I would say is that perhaps you could say that, all right, well, with, with less precipitation, you would get older ages. But then where it, where, where it sort of is really striking is when we look at the, uh, the Pamir Tibet. And then we have a really nice, uh, a surprisingly uh, statistically quite a, um, uh, quite a meaningful relationship between precipitation and, and thermochronometric age sort of suggesting that we get younger ages, so more erosion with higher precipitation, and then with lower precipitation, we get these older ages. And this, this, uh, this relationship only gets stronger when we combine the, uh, when we combine the, uh, uh, the Himalaya data with the, uh, the Pamir-Tibet data. So we get a broad range of ages and a, and a broad range of precipitations. And it shows a really, a really strong and really tight trend of <laughs> Again, sort of older ages with lower precipitation. So for my proxy of rock uplift, I've decided to use uh, geodetic strain. So this is an interpolated map after Creamer and others in 2014. And warmer colors are sort of higher strain and, and deeper colors are, are lower strain. And again, if, if we sort of were arguing for rock uplift controlling erosion, we would say, Okay, more strain, more rock uplift, more erosion, so younger ages. And, and in, the, in the Tian Shan Altai Sein, we, we don't really see that, that sort of a distinctive trend. It, it's pretty much a, a scattergun. This is a thermochronometric age on the Y axis and a geodetic strain on, on the X axis. In, um, in uh, the Pamir Tibet, uh, there's actually sort of like a, an inverted relationship. There is uh, increasing thermochron age with uh, increasing geodetic strain. And, and in, the, uh, in the Himalaya, again, we're sort of seeing a, a sort of very loose trend, perhaps sort of suggesting that with more strain, we're getting older ages. So I think, I think if I were to look at this as it had been presented, I would say that I am, I am back at that infinite loop. I am sort of, there is a relationship between, there is a relationship between the structure and there is a relationship between precipitation, but, but strain seems to be doing its own thing. You know, can we, can we start to pick at that a little further? And, and I'm gonna give it a shot and I'm gonna give it a shot using uh, something known as a topographic ruggedness index. Now, basically what this is, is it's a measure of relief. So you take a DEM for a given grid, grid cell, you look at um, basically the average uh, elevation change for that. And it gives it this index, in, uh, sorry, this valueless index, basically saying that higher, uh, the higher values have more elevation change for that grid cell and lower values have less elevation change for that grid cell. Now we're thinking about this in the terms of erosion and thermochron. So if you've got a high value, if you've got more relief, you would expect there to be younger ages and more erosion. And if you've got a lower value, you know, everything's nice and flat, you're probably going to get a lot less erosion. So we should see a really nice trend between thermochron age and relief and, or, and, and this ruggedness index. And so what I'm going to try and see is, well, all right, well, what does it co-vary with? Does it co-vary with strain? Or does it co-vary with precipitation? And so this is, this is strain first, and I'm not actually that convinced by this uh, relationship. So here we've got ruggedness on the y-axis and thermochronometric age on the x-axis. And I'm not 100% I'm not convinced with this relationship. In fact, I would say that most of the, uh, the high strain areas are kind of in the middle and the low strain areas are, are kind of spread out throughout it, spread throughout it. But where I, where I was really blown away with uh, blown away by is looking at how when we color the same index 
and they're the same relationship by precipitation, with, cool, with warmer colors being lower precipitation and cooler colors being higher precipitation. And, and I think that's pretty, uh, a pretty distinctive trend where we're getting sort of, we're transitioning from old ages and low precipitation into um, younger ages, high precipitation with, with high relief. So in summary, how I would say with those proxies has, has gone, we can relate them into the origins. We can go, all right, well, the Tian Shan Altai Saiyan, okay, it doesn't really work with distance to major structure, but locks in for the Pamir Tibet and the Himalaya. With modern precipitation, there seems to be a trend across all three. And then for geodetic strain, I would say that there is probably a very weak relationship, if anything, and, and an inverted relationship, something that we wouldn't really expect to see across all three origins. When we're looking at the ruggedness with age, I would say it co-varies really well with precipitation, but it, it is sort of invariant to strain and acts independently of strain. Now, the trouble with what I've just shown is that I am looking over, uh, I'm looking, I'm using a tool that looks over millions of years and I'm using a modern day proxy. It's a nice place to start, but if we want to say anything compelling, if we want to say anything interesting about this relationship, we're going to need to sort of uh, look through the purview of, of the paleo climate. So a, a good place to start is again, to just sort of summarize the ages and, and summarize them in, in a sort of different way. And what I'm gonna do is use a KDE, uh, sorry, a kernel density estimate. So that basically just uh, gives a, a quant, just basically quantifies the, uh, the number of ages in a, in a sort of stacked plot. And, and here they are sort of in a ranked KDE, um, uh, what's called a ranked KDE, where they're all sort of uh, compared next to each other. So we can try and pull out any relationships or any covariance between those origins. And I've, I've sort of split, split those three origins into their several sub origins. So we've got the Tian Shan and the Chilean Shan, the Altai Saiyan, Tibet, Pamir and the Himalaya. And I've also uh, not gone all the way back to the, the Triassic or the, uh, or the Permian, rather I've, I've sort of clipped it off at about 50 million years, about, about when, when sort of people are, are sort of comfortable with the idea that India is sort of um, colliding pretty aggressively into, into Eurasia. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just starting in the, in the Chilean Shan and the Tian Shan, if, if I were to look at that KDE and sort of say something meaningful about it, I would say that really it shows sort of sustained Cenozoic erosion. <laughs> There's no real change from the collision into more present day. It just kind of keeps trucking along. In, in, uh, in comparison, in uh, Tibet, Pamir and Himalaya, I'd actually say that there's very limited paleogene erosion. So whatever's, whatever's happening to generate erosion in the Tian Shan, there doesn't seem to be an equivalent response in Tibet, Pamir, or at least a preserved one at the moment. And then I would finally say that it seems that erosion is as it inc is increasing from the, from the mid Miocene to present day or about, about sort of 12 MA onwards. This is just a KDE of your uh, fishing track ages, is that right? Yeah, this is just the, these data. Got it, got it, yeah, thanks. Apologies. Yep. So, you know, let's, let's see how it compares to some climate proxies. Uh, something that uh, a lot of you would be familiar with is the the Zakos curve, so um, global delta O18, uh, the record of benthic forams in the, in the global ocean. And this is, this is used quite a lot to sort of see if, if you can uh, look at any trends in, in through tectonics, through the lens of tectonics, you can see any trends in, in the paleoclimate. And I've, I'd basically say that, that I don't really see any direct comparison, nothing that uh, really sings out to me. I mean, you've kind of got, you've got cooling uh, early on in the Cenozoic, but then there isn't really an erosional response. You could sort of argue that there's probably a bit of a warming there, but then again, still limited response. And then, you know, the cooling of the global climate in the more recent 15 million years doesn't really line up with when we start getting a lot of the activity in the Himalaya Pamir. But, where I think, I think that's a little too zoomed out. And I, the beauty of Central Asia is that there's a lot of data and a, a lot of data has been collected over a lot of time. And, and this is a, a really interesting record of uh, 
It's a delta O18 from pedogenic carbonates in the Tian Shan. And um, the way that the way that I read it, I'm not an expert on this, but the way that I understood it to be interpreted is that it really represents a, a stable Cenozoic moisture, moisture source. There's a lot of uh, variance in these, in these points. There's a lot of difference between them, but that is sort of interpreted as um, measurements from different basins, suggesting different sort of their own sort of individual signal. And rather when looked at as a whole, it's been sort of interpreted that the Cenozoic climate in Central Asia has been actually pretty stable. And this to me sort of, this to me sort of resonates with what we observe in the erosional record. We see a pretty stable Cenozoic erosion. So perhaps we're getting these sort of like internal variations around a, around a mean, but then, you know, the erosional record in the Cenozoic is sort of fluxing as, as it would with a sort of mild variations in the climate. And I thought that was pretty interesting, but, but where I, where I was really, what I was really drawn to is, um, some some work done by by uh, Detman and, and Quaid and others from this department. Uh, they have they've got a really beautiful uh, uh, Delta O18 record from carbonates in in Pakistan and, and Nepal, and basically they they see this this um, they see this record of of the of the they see the record of it getting more positive and they interpret this to be the onset of the the modern south asian monsoon and this is about at 11 ma and this to me matches way too well with uh, basically the increase of these these cooling ages in the himalaya so perhaps what we're seeing is is basically as we are getting these erosional ages in the himalaya perhaps that is a function of this onset of the modern south asian monsoon but i left us i left a, a sort of question a while ago and i've, I've kind of um i've kind of uh, uh digressed somewhat and so i'd like to sort of for the last little bit i'd like to pull us back to um this idea of well where is the erosional response of the india asia collision if it was so large and it was so vigorous as, as we know it is you know there should be like thermocron everywhere but you know, I, I've sort of shown you a map, and I've shown you some KDEs, and and there's really a really limited response, and and I think perhaps that the the, the climate is is really the key to understanding that, and the way that I am thinking about this is perhaps that basically when this collision occurs, there isn't the climate to generate the erosion to expose the rocks to generate those ages that we would need to to sort of match this kind of uh, quite vigorous collision. And I think to sort of visualize this, I'm gonna dive into a world that I'm really uh, not, not a, um, an expert to discuss, but, but here I am, um, paleoclimate modeling. And, and I think this is a, a really powerful tool because I think we can integrate our observations from Thermochrom, we can use our records of understanding erosion and we can feed those into a paleoclimate model to sort of see how they uh, how they couple in that space and you know does it, it could give us sort of testable uh, hypotheses but this is how I'm sort of viewing it now so here we're going to start in the uh, in the Cretaceous um, in the sort of mid Cretaceous this uh, very pixel this is a very pixelated uh, Central Asia we have the Altai Sayan up here Tibet and the Tian Shan, and this would be the, this is the Neotethys and, and sort of down here, you would have like Peri Gondwan and fragments and, and India is you know, probably lurking all the way down here. And what this shows is, is that the Tian Shan has a, it's actually got a fair bit of moisture. It's, it's sort of, there's a fair bit of precipitation with, with sort of greens being high precipitation and, and sort of browns being low precipitation. And the, the Altai Sayan is, is fairly dry and the Tibet, and Tibet is fairly dry. In the, in the late Cretaceous, Tibet gets a lot more arid. And interestingly, um, sorry, Tibet gets a lot more arid and the Tian Shan sort of again, probably gets slightly more arid, but a sort of similar kind of moisture pattern. But what was really interesting is this is when the Altai Sayan, Altai Sayan starts to get a little bit more moisture. And this is probably about the same time that we start to see a lot of these uh, thermocron ages coming through. But where, where, I, where I think 
what I've been thinking about with regards to where the uh, erosional signal is from the Indo-Eurasia collision, uh, I think it's got to do with the fact that, that Tibet would have been fairly arid at this point. And so here we've got uh, India coming in to the south or you know, about to collide or already collided. Um, and then the sort of the Altai Sands got a little bit of moisture and the Tian Shan again, pretty constant. And, and Tibet is just extremely arid. And that, that aridity is likely suppressing that erosion. Before, you know, here at, at sort of three to four MA, we kind of get the hydroclimate that we're a bit more familiar with, with high precipitation on, in the Himalaya and a pretty arid interior of Central Asia. <clears throat> So where does this leave us in the relationship between tectonics, climate, and erosion? Well, I think, I think if, I were, if I could summarize this, I would say that the way that I would think about it is, one, tectonics is still needed to require, it's still required to build the topography. I, I, think this is, I think this is why there is still this very distinctive relationship between Thermochron age and distance to structure, because you you know you can't sort of uh, make these uh, you you can't have sort of a flat surface that you interact with, and then you generate a bunch of thermochron ages. And there needs to be some sort of topography to couple with. The the thing is is that the uh, the tectonics lever is always cranking. When you're in a continental system, that tectonics lever is always going, and so that topography and that tectonics lever concentrates the precipitation. So this is an image of um, just coming up onto the uh, Tibetan plateau in, in Sichuan, and you can see the clouds are pooling at the base of the valley. And so that would sort of say, okay, well, you're getting way more precipitation and erosion down here, but then maybe over the other side, there isn't that much. And I, and I, think, that's, um, I think that's sort of, uh, uh, I think that's sort of really signified in this really interesting trend of, of increased precipitation with, with uh, younger ages and, and lower precipitation with, with older ages. But then I would then say that precipitation would then control the depth of erosion. So that, that magnitude of precipitation is going to be what's, what's ultimately modulating the erosion. And, and, so, and then the alternative there is that the aridity is suppressing erosion. If you don't have the moisture going, you can't move the material off the top to then expose the younger rocks. And I think that's where I'm gonna leave it with some final thoughts about this figure. Uh, this figure has been uh, living rent-free in my brain for about five years now, six years, since I read it back during my PhD. Uh, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting paper by Oman and others. Um, they basically got all this thermochron from across the world and they compared it to global climate. And they said, uh, global erosion is increasing and that is a function of a cooling climate. And you know, back when I first read it, I was like, ah, no, nah, these guys are barking up the wrong tree. Um, it's the Sadler effect, right? It's, it's a bias towards the recent. We've got these more recent rocks. We're just sampling more recent rocks. And, and sort of as I've gone on and, and looked a little bit more, I've gone, okay, maybe that's not necessarily correct. Maybe that's a little correct, but, but maybe the real problem is they're not taking into account structure. They haven't thought about these big structures controlling it. They're averaging uh, disparate ages, right? So, you know, two ages that might look close to each other on a map might actually be separated by a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, intricate uh, geometry. But, uh, a couple of people at Arizona have said this a few times, you know, you can't, you can't shake sort of good data and you can't sort of shake good observations. And I, I don't think I can shake this, this data and observations. We've got a cooling climate denoted by the blue curve and we've got an increase of erosion. But perhaps the interpretation needs a bit of a rethink. Perhaps, what is the other thing that you get during a cooling climate with more glaciation? you're probably going to get a lot more aridity. What if what we're seeing here isn't really an increase in the erosion rate, but perhaps that's a, a decrease in the erosion rate or an increase in the preservation rate. So that's kind of, that's a little bit further of where I'm thinking about this now. And, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Hey, thank you, Gilby. Uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, please uh, type in your questions in the chat and I can uh, 
relay them to Gilby, but uh, we have time for questions. I'm going to start off by asking students for questions. So if there are any student questions, why don't you guys go first? Yes. So I'm curious about the um, geodetic string. I can't recall, or sorry if you said this, but is it only horizontal velocities that go into that? And Gilby, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question for a second, please. Yeah, yeah. Cassie, Cassie asked a really interesting question about the geodetic strain. If it's if it's only horizontal strain that that's been go going into it, I I believe so. I, I think it's just the 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 sort of GP. It's based on uh, the mo GPS movements. Uh, uh, sorry, movements of GPS stations. So I think that would only be the the horizontal component. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Is your structure also include a lot of the strike flip faults? Yeah, so Cassie followed up by saying, um, does my does my structure sort of include strike slip faults? And no, uh, no, I, I sort of at some point I, you know, strike slip faults and, and things moving laterally is is a, a different way that strain could be accommodated in the crust. And and with with my purview, I, I sort of uh, uh, had to leave that aside. But that's a that's a really good point. Yeah, right. Do you know if anyone has tried to test the 360 bias preservation bias theory for the kernel density cross by by going into the Bay of Bengal, going into the fan and seeing if they can take their crown, take appetite, and fill in both their So you get all these recent ages in the Himalaya, that could be that could be that yes, you're uploading uploading recently, or you're just losing those older crystals to a resident and you've had uplift for a longer period of time. So you go try to find those crystals that might have been lost. Yeah, so Brandon asked a, a really good follow up question is okay well then if you're if I'm looking at the basement. Uh, the missing record should be in the sediments right and that, that would be out in the, in the Bay of Bengal and. Uh, so the the answer is yes, there have been studies on this looking in, at the detrital thermocron from IDP studies and it, it still misses these it still misses the big collision it still misses the sort of you know 60 to 45 ma dates that you would sort of go all right well that's the that's the hard collision and so that there is there is a lot of the sediment out there out there and they've not they've not plumed the depths of it but I, the from what has been observed it's not quite there it's not sort of a seamless one-to-one -one ratio out there other questions for gilby I think your um, your data is all bedrock for you, right? You didn't compile any different legends. Uh, uh, I some, but only reset once. Um, uh, but uh, but basically, yeah, you could just associate it all as, as bedrock. Uh, just tried to keep uh, keep that one, keep that moving part as as simple as as possible. Yeah, it seems real complicated, real fast. If you just try and reset. But I but I think but this is this is the. Sorry, Jamie asked if I if I was uh, looking just at basement dates, and I think herein is where you would go next. And so, do we we go to a given climate interval that we sort of maybe a climate excursion that we understand perhaps something like the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, and we step across it using detrital thermocron, and then we can sort of quantify the erosion response to a change in climate, and perhaps we can start to make really in, in informed, uh, maybe we can start to go, all right, well, if we see a certain amount of climate flux or a certain flux in, in the paleo climate, perhaps there is a, a quantifiable amount of erosion we should expect from that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I don't know if you see any relationship between the ages and like, like rock height. Uh, I uh, Lydia asked if I had categorized the ages by rock type, and the simple answer is no. I, I did not do that, and I'm not sure. Do you think there would be like you would expect to see like more erosion in the softer rocks, and like maybe at fault zones? That's maybe why you have like newer ages because there's more erosion because like weaker fault zones, like fault guards and stuff. I don't know if this is. Yeah, and, and so and so the follow up there is like, well, okay, well, why couldn't possibly rock rheology be controlling the erosion? And and I think I think sort of when we when we look at these systems, um, <laughs> I think rheology controls a whole lot. I think rock 
mineral, I think mineral chemistry and rock chemistry is, is uh, extremely important in understanding erosion. And the way that I would try to, um, the way that I would try with this study to sort of avoid that is I took a, a really big mallet. Basically, I'm just gonna try and, and hammer out that with, with just noise. And so that's a, another reason, or sorry, hammer that out with signal. And so that's another reason that uh, Central Asia is really good because you know, we've got a pretty broad range of rock types and a, a pretty large area. Whereas I think that's a, I think that's a sort of, again, one of these like, all right, well, we look, you know, this is how I'm pulling it out of a large regional scale study, but these are the sort of like the detrital system and the, the rheology sort of study is how you'd go in and be like, all right, well, can we test this? Do, does this hold up? Am I just, you know, do I, am I just sort of seen two lines and, and made a, made a guess? So yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a, it's a really good thing to, to keep looking at. Questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's open. It's open. Okay, so, um, so I have a question about the climate sucks. Um, so your climate model jumps from the Eocene to today, or the Pliocene, but a lot is happening in between there. And I would expect that once India docked, Right, but certainly by the Miocene, it's pretty much got you know modern-ish topography set up, right? Um, if that's the case, um, all those things being equal, I'd expect the monsoon to be stronger in the Miocene, being more of a climate and thermodynamics, and then getting weaker towards today, which is kind of the opposite of what you're saying. So, um, but what is happening? I think what stood out to me with your correlation between. Um, Himalayan OAT curve was that it is a, it is related to global warming, right? So can you rule out like that it's just not glacially induced erosion that's really dominating here rather than monsoon related precipitation? Yeah, so so Jess just brought up a, a bunch of really good points. The first one is that okay, so the, the development of the modern South Asian monsoon would be a weakening of the uh, a weakening of the um, of the, the modern of the South Asian monsoon rather than a strengthening of it. And that, you know, well, okay, there's a lot of climate in that. And and so, you know, perhaps that what the signal I'm seeing is is perhaps just sort of like a glacial or sort of maybe it's driven by other processes. Um, and you know, have I sort of accounted for that? So the the sort of the first thing I'm gonna address there is the the sort of development of the modern South Asian monsoon. So I tried to be very careful with my language. I said it's the onset of the, the modern South Asian monsoon as opposed to a, a weakening or a strengthening. I think the, the way that I've sort of uh, been thinking about it recently is perhaps we are seeing these, uh, we're seeing these ages, we're seeing these basement ages, perhaps because it is weaker as opposed to stronger. So if it were stronger, we would be still removing far more rock. The reason that we start to see those ages come through because it's weaker but that's a little bit uh that's a little bit uh putting the cart way ahead of the horse as far as sort of glaciation comes into things i mean uh, i mean absolutely but then you would expect sort of perhaps a trend with with elevation coming in you have more glaciation in, in more elevated areas um and and sort of as you move away from that you would probably get less erosion um, and, and there just really isn't a trend between, between elevation and, and thermocron age. I think the, the last thing there is there is a, a question which is about resolution. And the tool that I'm using is coarse. It is, it is very coarse. The, the resolution on a, on a climate signal is, is far, far more precise than sort of the error on a fishing track age. And I think that where we need to make a thermocron as a community where we can make some strides is we can try to improve that resolution. Perhaps we can start pulling out these, uh, these more specific signals. If I could just follow up on that. I'm not sure I understand how the carbonate O18 indicates the onset of the monsoon in a way. How is that not just global cooling when the carbonate data moving from minus 10 to minus uh, that's uh, so a, a lot of that I've relied on on sort of the published literature and, and other people who have worked on it, or other people who have worked with it. And the sort of understanding is that that's when that's when uh, you're getting a, a sort of big shift in the uh, a big change in the in the hydroclimate at that time. Yeah, I know it's not your record, but I think there's a number of ways you can interpret that yes. data. 
And I know that Ranfeng has a myosin simulation, so you might be able to just look at the myosin simulation and see how strong the monsoon is in that. Compare it to the late Pleistocene and see if that trend holds up. Yeah, that'd be a that'd be a really good thing to look at. Yeah, other questions. Um, so I know a lot of people documented the large scale vaporization in a lot of these landscapes. So I'm just curious if you also have a general part of ages to sort of like a temporal bridge of how they're going to be applied. I I would like to, but I think that my uh, yes, that has been considered, but I think that uh, I think that um, the the trouble with uh, cosmogenic nuclides is again that sort of range is is too too fine for me to sort of connect to. I'm sort of I'm sort of losing a lot of resolution at sort of five million years, and that's that's kind of you know okay, beryllium ten can go back to sort of ten million years, but but maybe where it's being used, it's it's not quite getting there. And I think I just I think there is a, a disconnect between cosmogenic nuclides and, and thermocron as, as far as the processes that they're discussing. But that's a that's a, a really good point. And, and sorry to repeat the question, it was have I looked into the, the cosmogenic nuclide record? And the, the sort of simple answer is, is no, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah, so this is a bit moving to more random than just that have you gone in and just looked at any nearby depositional environments or um, fiscal depositional environments such as ocean records, say in the North Pacific or in the Bay of Bengal, whatever, to see if you see changes in lipogenic fluxes at the same time that you see these enhancements. I can't remember what your third one was that had the late Miocene of oh, trend, but right in the way it's shorter, Indian Ocean, but then it's like Amir, I don't know if they have any drill ports to go far enough and say with Cairo, mm -hmm. but I mean, even North Pacific sediments. I know there's records that span how reliable they are. East China Sea, for example, right? Sorry. East China Sea. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, there's 25 million year old dust records in the North Pacific. So I just was curious if you've looked at, um, you know, if you see temporal um, similarities between the two years. Uh, so the, the question was, had I had I sort of dug into the, uh, the marine record and the depositional record, the offshore record, and seen how that, how that flux compares to, to what I would observe in the basin. And 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 uh, no, no, unfortunately, I haven't. But but again, that's sort of part of that's where I would then consider going next is like, well, does it match up in the in the sedimentary record? I, like I think that would help to elucidate a bit between the increased monsoon versus glaciation because mm. you you showed a really sharp peak there a little bit later than that ten million year onset for the Himalayas. There's records of enhanced dust accumulation right at where you start getting these glaciation at that same time hmm. and so if you could make that connection between maybe a distal dust record or a distal lipogenic record you know to your uh, ages you know maybe that could help in parsing that out oh, that's, a, that's a really good comment thank you yeah yeah i was, I was actually going to bring up something similar um there's in southeast alaska where it's very high uplift rates and high photography there's there's a, a good Signal for the onset of vegetation by Pleistocene when sediment directly offshore is this real part of the speed drive there. And it's just sudden boom as it is a pretty big deal. It, it does appear, at least there, it's glacier speed very high. Maybe it's too much of a scale, but I don't know if you're talking about it. Uh, uh, Jack just said, sort of reiterated that I should look at the, uh, the sedimentary record. Uh, uh, offshore to look at evidence for the onset of, sort of glaciation and, and yeah that, I, I couldn't agree more it's a really good point Jack I'd love to discuss this with both of you yeah I was just going to add to that there's some really good records in the Bengal plan the IBP and the Nicobar plan looking at sediment fluxes you can look at that Indo Burma range which is probably right at 14 to 12 you get to the influx of sediment delta for erosion and the um, Ganges probably which are at the same time a big change in the provenance of and, and Stuart just reiterated uh, <laughs> some of the work he's done in the Bengal fan. Guilty, you sound like a uh, cricket commentator. Uh, <laughs> 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 I think no, no. Devin's working on that too. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. hey, uh, Guilty, if it will, other questions? We've got time. I was going to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, 
I don't know if I, maybe this is for beers afterwards, but uh, you can have an extreme event today. Let's say you have an extreme rainfall event in places that have old rocks. And if you then count the thermocron ages there, because they're now exposed because of some extreme landslide or rainfall event, uh, you're now exposing new old thermocron ages, but with a modern rainfall event. That's a possibility, correct? It it depends on it depends on how aggressive the uh, the landslide was, and depends um, on where that happens. But, as but, well, right? but yes, like if you if you sort of you could um, there is every opportunity that with a a large uh, a large sort of uh, flux in that that climate, if you get sort of a a high amount of precipitation, you would just expose like slightly younger ages, but not not hugely. Uh, that's that's the issue with using uh, using a modern a modern record. Right, but at the same time, it's not accurate to reconstruct or to plot at the time rainfall versus those ages as well, right? Because you can have temporal leaps and lags in terms of when those things get exposed, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how do you take that into account? What's not to say that glaciation caused the exposure of all of these ages? Uh, I think, so uh, that's, a, that's a sort of- They again, can hear me on Zoom, so it's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really sure how to, how to structure that. Yeah, so I, I mean, I mean, you know, there is, there is like, there is no, um, there is sort of, there is a, an issue with using any one of these proxies, and and I, and I think that is a sort of accurate point, and, and perhaps sort of looking into a into a glaciation record would provide more detail. Um, however, we we sort of uh, we sort of from from present day we see a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the erosion happens very rapidly after we get a change in the climate. If you get sort of a rainstorm coming through, you move a lot of sediment, right? And then you and then you sort of um, and then the sort of you see that you see that sort of slope sort of stabilize, and, and there'd be less erosion. But then you keep that going for like you know that's these thermocron ages get exposed over millions of years. So then you know you keep having that change in climate, or you keep having those sort of storms come through. Well, like once in a you know, once in a freak sort of storm every, you know, 20 years over a million years would, would sort of expose a lot of rocks. So, I'm not, you know, it's not a it's not a perfect proxy to look at climate at any one given point in time. However, we, you know, we kind of got to start thinking about these systems uh, as kind of coupled and and they do, you know, changes in the in the in the hydroclimate and changes in atmospheric circulation do lead to more erosion and thus they will influence uh you know your thermocron age, and so you know it's at some point you gotta you gotta break that circle and, and have a look. I I just wonder if some lead lag analysis on the benthic curve, mm -hmm. like instead of putting up global precip on your y-axis, mm -hmm. or instead of putting up you know shear and the other stuff that you had on your y-axis, I wonder if you had uh, some type of a uh, phased you know change to see where you get the maximum correlation. I wonder if that could. You know, provide something to me. But. Well, I think the, I think the way I think, so I think the the sort of the way that I would move forward with this is again trying to like again isolate like a single event and look at the erosional response to that one single event, and and so going all right, well, you know, do you see that? Do you see that lag between those systems over that single interval, and how major is that that erosion? And, and that's a that's a sort of study that's. Uh, it's got legs at the moment, so. Okay, other questions for Gilby? We maybe have time for one more question. Okay, uh, Barbara tells me we're gonna have beers afterwards uh, at uh, Gentle Bend. So for those of you who are interested, uh, please join along. And uh, let's give Gilby another round of applause. Thanks, everyone. And if you could just turn your tables, uh, we would highly appreciate that. Thank you.